Will you pray with me? God, help us answer the cry to stand up, to move beyond, to continue to reach for you in all that we do. For you are our rock, our redeemer, our sculptor, our very breath. Amen. Right around the turn of the 20th century, a Creole boy named Ferdinand Morton was a young teenager in New Orleans. Every night around the same time, he would pack a small bag and kiss his great-grandmother with whom he lived goodnight. She had been nice enough to take him in when his mother had remarried, and he loved her very much. Then he would shut the door of the house behind him and set off, or so she thought, to his job as a night watchman at a local barrel factory. But then instead of heading to the factory, he would make a turn and head the other direction. He was, in fact, sneaking out to play piano at a local brothel going by a rather naughty stage name. <laughs> when his great-grandmother found out, she told him that he had to give it up. It simply would not be allowed under her roof. It was her house or the music. In his own words, however, he just couldn't put it behind him. No matter how much his great-grandmother meant to him, the music called to him, made him come alive. And so, convinced that the devil music would be his downfall, she kicked him out of the house and locked the door behind him. Now, this morning's scripture says that on the morning of the festival of Pentecost, or 50 days after the harvest, the disciples were also locked in a small upper room in Jerusalem. It was both a failure and a success. A success because Jesus had told them to wait for the sign of God's Spirit, and they were waiting. But it was also a failure because they were locked away in fear. As all of the Jewish people from all over the world gathered in their city, they alone remained hidden away. The Romans were not pleased with their Jesus-following form of Judaism, as it was causing a lot of trouble. And the others, tribes from all over, were likely only too happy to point out a disciple because it was going to keep the soldiers off their backs. After all, the Jesus followers were radicals, troublemakers, bringing attention to the city. They were like a spark lit too close to a matchbox. So the disciples remained hidden behind locked doors. Now, early in the book of Genesis, the story says that God instructed the very first humans to go forth and multiply, to fill the lands of the earth, all of the lands. Yet by the 11th chapter of the book, we find all of the humans have been gathered together again. They came upon a land that they found pleasing, and they decided to build there a city so that they might all stay together in that place, never to be scattered or without each other. So they set about construction first of a wall, so no one could leave or enter, and then of a tower so they could see everything that was coming their way. They planned to stay all of one language and one speech forever, until came a sound like a rushing wind, and suddenly each was speaking in a different language. Before, they had been filled with uniformity. Indeed, some texts say that each brick of the tower they constructed was valued more highly than the people, because the people were so alike. But now they had been sent out from the city walls to divide and to multiply, to fill the earth not with sameness, but with difference. It is common in the church to speak of Pentecost as the reversal of this story in Babel. Where before God had created diversity, here God creates unity and sameness. But this is false. God does not create unity, not even harmony necessarily. Each one hearing and speaking in their own language, done together towards a common purpose. That is the story of Pentecost. It is less like uniformity and more like jazz. You see, instead of being known as a degenerate, 
like his great-grandmother feared, Ferd, or Jelly Roll Morton, is remembered as the very first published composer of a new form of music soon to be called jazz. Although others have claimed the title as fathers of jazz, Ferd stands out for his unique style. He intentionally played more slowly than others of the time. He picked up the basic rhythms and swing with his left hand, and the melody with his right thumb. This left the harmony to be played with the other fingers of his right hand. Now, if you can picture that, that meant that it was almost out of tune, rustic, <clears throat> distinct. It was barely controlled, almost dissonant. <clears throat> it's the sound, in short, that we have come to associate <clears throat> with jazz just on the edge of losing it, but somehow bringing it all together, creating something new, a new human language, a new music, unity, and forward movement out of chaos. In his memoir about his conversion to faith, Blue Like Jazz, the author Donald writes, I have never liked jazz music because jazz music doesn't resolve. But I was outside the Baghdad Theater in Portland one night when I saw a man playing the saxophone. I stood there for 15 minutes, and he never once opened his eyes. After that, I liked jazz music. Sometimes you have to watch somebody love something before you can love it. It is as if they are showing you the way. Similarly, I used to not like God, because God doesn't resolve. And that's the thing, friends. God doesn't resolve. God keeps building. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young shall see visions, and your old shall dream dreams. We are the ones who like to build walls. You can think of modern politics, if you like, or of modern church. Martin Luther King Jr. once famously said that the most segregated hour in America was 11 a.m. on a Sunday. But God doesn't like easy resolution and never has. The theologian Cornell West has written that working for freedom, creating God's vision, is a lot like jazz. The interplay of individuality and unity is not one of uniformity imposed from above, but it's of conflict among diverse groupings that reach a dynamic consensus. As with a soloist in a jazz quartet, individuality is promoted in order to sustain and increase the creative tension in a group. A tension that yields higher and higher levels of performance to achieve the aim of the collective project. Or as the jazz great Wynton Marsalis has put it, today you can go into and make a modern recording with the bass playing first, then the drums come in later and they track the trumpet later and then the singer comes in and they ship the tape somewhere. None of the musicians have played together. You simply can't play jazz music in that way. In order for you to play jazz, you've got to listen to them. The music forces you at all times to address what other people are thinking and for you to interact with them with empathy and to deal with the process of working things out. It reminds you that you can work things out with other people, jazz does. It's hard, but it can be done. It urges you to accept the decisions of others. Sometimes you lead and sometimes you follow, but you can't give up, no matter what. It is the art of negotiating change with style. The aim of every performance is to make something out of whatever happens, to make something together, and be together. In other words, God is a lot more like Ferd Morton, using each one of us to play the melody with one thumb over here, while she picks up the harmonies with the other fingers and the swing on the other side. Your young shall see visions and your old shall dream dreams. Each of us 
with our own voices, our own dreams, our own visions, working together towards something even bigger than resolution, something new, creation. This is the question of the church today as it has always been. What shall we create together? What dream will you contribute? The spirit is certainly moving. Will you answer or will you lock yourself away? <laughs>